Okay. Welcome. This is the day and the community forum. <coughs> Welcome to friends, yeah. faculty, uh, family, and sponsors, and all who have made possible what we have today. And this is a, a moment of, of celebration, for accomplishment. And today we have also a very special program. And we are going to start uh, with different panels. And I will explain again the logistics so that we refresh the logistics, how it works. So we have panel after panel. Yeah, panel after panel. And within each panel, we have three, four, or five participants. And some of them could be at distance, and most of them are in, in the presence. Each of them has 12 minutes for presentation, and then two minutes barely for two questions, two Q&A, and then one minute for transition for the next uh, presenter. After we have the presentations, then we will have also another like nine minutes for Q&A and one minute for transition. And the first panel will be um, the slow burn to resilience, applying community guidance for embracing rapid change with um, Davis Clark. I hope Davis, you are distance. Oh, as panelists, Chase Cordova, Shan, and Landon. Please come in. Mm -hmm. Welcome. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. We thank you for your time and dedication to make it to this early morning panel. I am beyond honored to be standing up here with some truly amazing human beings and fantastic friends. With me up here, I have Chase, I have Landon, we've got Davis on Zoom, and my name is Sean. As many of our colleagues yesterday highlighted and will continue to highlight through this community panel, many of the problems that we face today are wicked problems meaning that an action in one place can often result in an unintended consequence somewhere else. The reason this is so prevalent is because actions and their outcomes are really context dependent. And all too often we see the specific contexts of communities or environments being forgotten and swept to the side in the pursuit of really quick solutions and quick action. Seeing the importance of understanding the specific needs and context of our communities led all of our work in a different direction, though. All of us really focused on collaboration, working on community guidance and framework styled models. And it is this ethos behind our work that really connects all of our projects. Now I'm going to hand the mic off to Chase. Thank you, friend. The foundation of environmental solutions lies in the inclusive nature of their efforts. With every wave of environmentalism thus far, uh, we have seen an emphasis on taking action by a selective few. As we all both in this room and on Zoom understand, environmental justice plays an instrumental role in how we engage in topics of sustainability as a community spanning nations, states, continents, we understand that the majority of the modern environmental movement has been backed by colonial and exclusive mindsets and mentalities. Moving forward, we need to realign as a community, <coughs> embracing a more instrumental community-based framework for action moving forward. Following on that theme of inclusivity, each of our projects have operated on the data-informed uh, premise that unique communities really relate to the environment through um, already existing subcultural frameworks and systems. And while these frameworks can be improved, um, <coughs> it's counterproductive often to uh, try to impose too quickly an outside framework or model um, for the risk of imposing an agency and doing harm. So being able to recognize that uh, the community environmental relationships uh, really fall into frameworks that we can witness and that we can guide very gently towards maximizing priority of the environment uh, really is key to each of these projects. And this is uh, appropriate within the community culture. 
each of our projects had implemented this with a high degree of positive feedback. In essence, the data affirmed that when you take the time that it takes, it takes less time. And the uh, outcomes that are built along the way um, tend to be, make for a more resilient type of change in human systems, as opposed to an, a philosophy of a quick return on investment. So we've called this the slow burn to resilience. And you will see this methodology at play in each of our presentations, regardless of the actual speed um, that the projects have played out. Ladies? When building, improving, or working within a community framework, it is important to lean on the individual strengths of the community you're working with rather than copying and pasting a framework that worked in another community. The needs of each community may require investing in one form of capital, such as social, financial, built, human, or natural, over another. Building frameworks that work to sustain, preserve, conserve, or improve existing capital while investing in capital that a community lacks can have cascading effects. This is referred to as the spiraling up effect. As we invest in one form of capital, it can have direct or secondary benefits on other forms of capital. For example, my project looked at how investing in a community social capital through the creation of farmer cooperative groups can lead to the improvement of the community's financial capital from the shared savings and loans accounts they create, built capital from the infrastructure they build using these shared loans accounts and NGO assistance, and human capital from the women empowerment and entrepreneurial yeah. programs that their supportive agencies promote. Over time or throughout the slow burn, these investments will grow and have direct and indirect benefits throughout the community that ultimately contribute to the community's overall well being and resilience. And with that, I think we can lead into our projects, presentations. We had a little diagram kind of showing how all of these components play into community guidance. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Landon Scheller, and this is my project, um, Recreation in Crested Butte, uh, Welcoming Change and Sharing Sense of Place Through Environmental Ethics. Uh, so most of you who know me, I know that I study indigenous cultures more than anything else, but I wanted to do my MEM based around mountain towns because uh, as close to paradise as places like Crested Butte really feel, there's something going on here anthropologically um, that really make this to be these kind of places a hotbed for environmental conflict. And I wanted to create something that could address that. So um, over the last summer, I got to work as a conservation ranger for the Crested Butte Land Trust and got to get a little hands-on feel on the ground for some of this issue. Um, I also dug into a lot of really amazing research from authors like Justin Farrell of Billionaire Wilderness and uh, some other uh, really cool research like the Mountain Migration Report. And the data kind of shows that um, there's a little bit of an urban flight scenario going on where people from outside places are flocking to mountain towns uh, for the quality of life that the experience offers. And while this is fine, uh, kind of that influx had, comes attached to a bunch of different economic situations, uh, which are tending to push locals out. Uh, this chart here shows a pretty good demographic, or uh, kind of a demonstration of this demographic change, where we can see kind of housing availability and affordability um, at the, have gotten way worse, and, and they're kind of meeting this issue. But across the board of these markers for well-being in mountain towns, we're seeing a heavy decline, things like environmental impacts and quality of life. And I wanted to get into this with my project. So this really became the why of, of what I wanted to do. And digging into kind of the psychology behind it, uh, the theme of belonging and sense of place really came into its own. So belonging, you know, being something that creates a lot of quality of life for us. And the uh, sense of place being what really makes for that um, belonging in communities. Now, sense of place is also kind of the basis for the ethics that we model around environment. And 
locals uh, tend to model that and teach that to people who are new to communities. But this can be a, a little bit of a problem, right? If locals are getting forced out, like we saw in the previous slide. So the problem kind of becomes if new arrivals uh, don't have the locals to lean on to show them a sense of place which prioritizes the environment, then the environment really tends to get disregarded in that sense of belonging. And this created a really cool <clears throat> question for me, right? What will we do? Will we learn to offer a path for belonging in Crested Butte uh, that prioritizes a care for the land? Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Uh, so I took this question to my dear friend and mentor, Marcy Tellender. That's her in the upper right there. And she is the founder and godmother of something called a Minotauk celebration. And I won't get into too much detail about what Minotauk does, but in uh, a nutshell, it's a community animation festival in Crested Butte uh, that takes place around the fall equinox every year. And more than being just a really great party, uh, sort of themed around uh, ancient European practices, uh, this is actually a place for the community to come together and internally share environmental ethics. Uh, this is a place to retell stories of past conservation successes, like fighting the uh, mine on Red Lady. It's also a place to reimagine what the future could look like uh, as people rededicate and recommit to environmental work within the community. So Marcy has been doing this kind of work for 35 years in the community and really having great success with uh, kind of advancing this environmental framework of what sense of place means here. Uh, but we wanted to kind of bring some other people into the fold. And as I designed this project with her as my community sponsor, uh, we really centered around this idea of like, what does this process look like for a person to become local? And the idea of recreation is what emerged. Uh, this happens for at the individual level, right? Newcomers to the community recreate their sense of place and their belonging to place through learning new ethics and behavior towards the environment. And likewise, the community of Crescent View reinvents or recreates its ethics every year when new people come into that and they get to share those things. Uh, so we decided that um, kind of creating an online resource for this, that could, we could share environmental ethics uh, in perpetuity with people as they come in and are welcome to the community was really a great place to start this process. And so the product that I have created for and, and creating for this uh, NEM is probably the coolest environmental ethics blog you've ever seen. <laughs> uh, this is going to look like a, a welcome package, but what it is, is we're putting it into an online uh, resource so that people can have access to it at any time for free. Um, it's going to be a collection of essays, films, poems, art, any type of creative expression that can really communicate the values and the ethics of the environment that CB has forged over many decades. Uh, this is a place for the true expression of CB's elders and uh, locals in all of the ways that they want to share knowledge and wisdom with incoming generations. Uh, so it's going to be a multimedia kind of a platform. There'll be lots of different forms of expression. Uh, there's going to be a grassroots kind of distribution through our partners and affiliates. And um, we're also going to have like an actual hard copy sort of a distribution where we have gift bags we can give out to uh, people who are new. And uh, these will have like a, a printed letter with some nice artwork and a QR code linking to an online resource. What we asked for uh, from our contributors was really to express all the different forms of life in Crested Butte. So it's a very diverse crowd of people that we're recruiting uh, for these contributions. And uh, we wanted them to kind of share their approach to the land and people and how to do this with respect. Um, how you can come into the community and accept responsibility for the health and the sustainability of the land, which is really central to that idea of a sense of place here. Um, and also uh, hopefully offering to the community individual gifts and abilities. Uh, the plan is that 
enough diversity and inclusivity will be represented that an outsider coming to Crested View will find a place for themselves within the ethics of this place and really engage with this dialogue in a new way. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of things that I can show you about this project at the moment because it is a, a work in progress. We have significant progress made on every aspect of this deliverable. Uh, but this is something that is going to take a little bit of time to finish. Um, it, I would call this kind of the slow burn to resilience, right? And, and for this MEM project, what that means is we're involving a lot of different contributors. We have a very diverse set of responsibilities and needs, very diverse timelines. And uh, each of these, are resp I'm responsible for working with in a really healthy way. So taking the time that it takes to cultivate trust and alignment with folks really has to be the, the centerpiece of this project. It's something I committed to early on with Marcy as a way of um, doing the justice to the actual community and its ethics. And truly in the CB community, uh, this process of a slow burn to resilience uh, is manifest as well, right? They're overcoming distrust and exclusivity between these newcoming groups and locals. And that's not something that happens overnight. Uh, so we've got to reach hearts first and then minds, bring people into the fold about our place and what it means to be here. And truthfully, I see this as kind of a decolonizing process. Um, you know, the systems that work in mountain towns, like many other places, uh, often revolve around uh, privilege. You know, politics and economics are often uh, kind of pandering to privileged folks. But by placing environmental ethics back in the seat of the people to be expressed by the people shared with people uh, that sort of takes that back to a decentralized position and uh, that's what we really wanted to focus with this project i sort of envision it as being like a mycelium network where the real work happens underground the strength and the resilience and the growth uh, happens where you can't see it and at the right time at the right place of emergence it shows its fruiting body and that's what this project will be doing here as well. Uh, kind of midsummer, probably at the end of July, we'll be online with the online blog. Um, but until then, this is a, a product of really creating relationships. Oh, here it is. So with that being said, I want to just acknowledge um, the amazing work of Benetok and uh, their collaboration with me on this project. Really could not have made a better um, sponsor and uh, really digging into this work with me is in a, in a good way. I'd also like to make, throw a big shout out to the Crested Butte Land Trust who have been just so encouraging to me and helpful with finding the right contributors to the project. Um, I'll likewise to Hicka and particularly Sue Navy for telling her amazing story about the fight on Red Lady. And then we've been working with uh, Connor Hagen and Ali Batman with Red Lady Films to include some really great um, short films in the project. Lastly, a shout out to my uh, project mentor, Dr. Salif Muhammad, who has just been super helpful and uh, patient with me throughout this process. Uh, to Dr. Michael Russell and IPLM Track for funding the project. Big thank you to you. And uh, a shout out to Lindsay Dillazal and Jillian Bauer for some badass admin support. And again, <laughs> one more, please. My last acknowledgement is just to the land herself. Uh, in our Western mindset, we often think of land as a resource or commodity. Uh, but the indigenous ancestors of this place knew it to be an animate and a sentient thing. And I'm just so grateful to the beautiful place that we live uh, that has kind of embraced me and helped me to understand the need to, to offer something back for myself. So hopefully this project uh, has done a little bit of work. And uh, with that, I have questions or comments. How do people find belonging in a place like Crested Butte when they face both like exclusionary language by people who have been there for a long time and may already have an environmental ethic but are forced to um, either commute to get to that area or to potentially live um, you know, in vehicles or on the land in a way that's demonized and criminalized? Absolutely great question. Um, we have so many things to do to address all of those problems. 
Um, hopefully this project can speak to that a little bit by sharing authenticity and stories um, so people can see uh, really the, the crux of what's going on and see it maybe from a local's perspective. Um, but it's also meant to be a welcome package, right? And like you said, this kind of exclusive language that people may feel alienated by, um, hopefully that doesn't have a place in, <laughs> in this project. It's something that um, locals can speak to in a much more heart-to-heart -heart kind of a way. And maybe we can supervent or uh, circumvent the tendencies that we had to fall into these narratives. Um, so that's kind of my hope for this project, but there's a lot of deep work that needs to be done with those things. And it, it's, again, kind of a slow burn, right? It, it doesn't happen overnight. We can't decolonize all of these systems immediately. Um, so, yeah, I'm just hoping to kind of provide a little bit of an inroad to a discourse that's healthier in each of those ways that you, you mentioned. And that's sort of the approach that I decided to take um, rather than trying to legislate a policy initiative that would hopefully be a silver bullet solution. I'm not sure there are silver bullets for this problem. Uh, Rich, yeah, I, I'm wondering if there's ways to uh, productively uh, and uh, ethically engage people out on the land. Uh, because my personal opinion is if you want to belong to the land, you've got to shed your blood, shit, uh, sweat, and tears on it. And so there's a lot of activities to just get people out there in a positive way uh, so that they might realize, hey, I didn't know this existed and start caring about it. So is, are there ways to work that into, into this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I, I feel exactly the same. That's that's kind of one of my credos as well. And um, yeah, there's a lot of room for the expansion of this project. Uh, part of the expansion that I had envisioned was sort of uh, leading ethical walks, right, or peripatetics, <laughs> talking about philosophy and ethics and belonging to landscape uh, by actually hiking across the land with groups of people. And uh, you know, HICA and the Land Trust have done a great job of coordinating similar sort of things for stewardship. I feel like we can naturally extend that into a little bit of an ethical framework and, and have some events like that. Um, but absolutely, this is something that I, I proselytize all the time. And I'm, every time I encounter people out on the land, that, that's what I like to talk about. I think there's a lot of room for expansion into that. Uh, I think, yeah. Um, I saw there was a quote on one of your slides that said, be more wild than good. And I just thought that was interesting and kind of wanted to know what that meant to you. Yeah, thanks. That's a, a slogan that has kind of been a, a mainstay for Vinatalk for a long time. It has a lot of different meanings within the Vinatalk context. Um, but, you know, sort of the idea that in order to be good citizens, uh, according to our, our mainstream culture, we have to kind of fall into the party line, right, and, and play the game of consumerism and things like that. And Vinatok rebels a little bit against that and says, be more wild than good. Connect to the wild side a little bit more and things will kind of naturally fall into a more orderly place that we, we need them. So in a nutshell, that's what it means, but there's there's lots of levels to interpret that. Great. Hello. We have a one minute turnover period. Thank you very much for your patience. Thanks for those laughs. I need it before my nervousness. I was hoping they play music at this point just to take some of the edge off. Sing. Just sing. Always a fan of Jeopardy personally. Pretending you can't hear me. I'm going to go on this side. Hello, everyone. Thank you for laughing along with me, first off. Uh, second off, my name is Chase Cordova, and this is my presentation. Uh, a little bit of background on me. Uh, this is my fifth year here at Western. I'm a part of the 3 plus 2 program. I'm currently a candidate to graduate my master's in environmental management, and my specific track is integrative public lands management. Uh, this is just a slightly different perspective on what all that can entail. 
Uh, my project, however, is listed before you. Diversifying environmental praxis, a belonging and inclusivity assessment of the Clark School and of Environment and Sustainability. A little bit of background to this project. It was heavily informed by, actually informed and based upon a survey in 2019 that was distributed to graduate students between the cohorts of 2016 and 2018. Uh, the focus of the survey itself was a DEI competency, or it was basically assessed DEI competency of those groups in various areas. And what I did was just basically improve upon it. That leads into the why of my project. Exactly what this is and what my survey is, is to expand and update that previous survey and to give Clark School Environment and Sustainability, SES for future reference, a leadership and up-to-date understanding of the community climate in the realm of belonging. It's also to honor and reflect of, on my experience of the last five years. Again, I've been here for a little bit and I'm grateful to have had a lot of conversations with many peers and other students. And this is just kind of honor a lot of those and hopefully inform movement moving forward. To explain a bit of my methods, uh, again, as I mentioned before, I spent a wide majority of my first semester and over the summer talking with my peers, not limited to just students or faculty or staff, but a conglomerate of all of those groups to get an idea of what kind of discussions they wanted to have, what kind of discussions they were having on their own and behind closed doors, and what they wanted to see and be able to discourse about more openly. Also, what I was able to do was uh, do a bit of research on finding the best practices specifically in two realms. One of those being on updating the demographics portion to make those a bit more robust and comprehensive to better represent our population. And then to uh, establish a, better, a best practices for uh, specifically looking into sense of belonging. I also was able to review that previous survey and all the responses that it entailed. And this then resulted in me creating the survey itself. This survey took the form of a Google Form survey, which, that, which was distributed online. The total longest response path had 55 questions, with 56 total respondents having participated in it by the end and closing it uh, last week. So this was very, very soon. The sample demographics included undergraduate students, both for major and minor, graduate students across every track associated within the School of VMVS, staff, part-time faculty and staff, in addition to alumni student groups for undergraduate and graduate students between commencement of 2019 and 2022. Uh, one of the main goals of the survey was to provide kind of a timeline of sense of belonging between 2016 and 2022 slash 2023 right now, this graduating class. My specific survey, its attempt was to measure sense of belonging broadly, in addition to focusing more specifically on DEI, perceptive sorry, perceived DEI, inclusivity, and then, like I said, a more robust demographic base to see how people felt that they're being represented in their views on these various areas. <laughs> Going into the result itself, I want to establish kind of the parameters of it. Uh, I did see some limitations in terms of my response. You're going to see two graphs here. One is gender and one is race, not being compared with anything else. Uh, so out of the 56 respond respondents, I had about 48 of those being woman, female, or feminine, uh, with, with just almost 20 of them being male, masculine, and then only a few non-cisgender. Uh, throughout a theme that you'll see throughout the course of this in my research is how I had to lump various groups together um, in order to better represent and analyze the information that they're giving me. Something that I couldn't do was misrepresent a number of those individuals. So based on how they responded and answered, I had to leave them separate so that I did not misrepresent the answers and information that they were giving me. On the other hand, like the one below uh, regarding race, a vast majority of my respondent base was white, specifically 48 of those being white with only seven non-white, including mixed race, including non-white. That's an example of an area where you see I lumped certain groups together to represent their ideas. And since their uh, backgrounds are more aligned I could do so. So keep that in mind throughout these the next few graphs. Again, moving forward, all of them are from the overall representation. Another thing I was wanting to anticipate from the survey was if there was a varying sense of belonging based around if you were a student, if you were a staff member, if you were a faculty member, if you were an undergraduate or graduate student, and something I found that that was actually not the case, that that did not play a role in sense of belonging. And so in the following graphs that you're about to see, all of these are from the entire group, the entire survey respondent base being lumped together in their respective groups. Pudding. There we go. So what I found, uh, this graph you're gonna see before you is from the perspective of gender, alongside sense of belonging. And this is one of the areas where I found a pretty significant uh, difference. So in this case, within the Clark SES, amidst all of these groups, men, masculine, 
have a higher perceived sense of belonging compared to women, female, or feminine. And then alongside, you can see non cisgender. But there is a cascading effect between a higher representation of men feeling more of a sense of belonging compared to women and non cisgender folks. Next, there would be a perceived DEI competency by role. And when I say by role, that's not each role perceiving their sense of belonging or sorry, their DEI competence, but instead everyone's perceived DEI competence for these respective groups. At the highest, we're going to see students, followed by staff, followed by faculty. However, there was a significant impact on perceived overall DEI competency for the Clark School as a whole, uh, meaning that for as long as it seems to be an individual association and relationship with any one of these individuals or groups, they seem to have a higher perceived competency compared to the Clark SES as a whole. Next, moving to these next graphs, it'll be from the perspective of race, looking at perceived DEI competency by those particular groups. On your left, you're going to see the perceived DEI competency uh, for staff with non-white and mixed race, including white, having a lower perceived staff DEI competency compared to white folks. And similarly, for students perceived competency in DEI, non-white folks perceived a lower DEI competency for, by non-white people compared to white folks. Next, also from the foundation and base of white, or sorry, from, not from the foundation and base of, right, of race, uh, we're going to see overall inappropriate comments. So from the perspective of being non-white and non-race, not sorry, mixed race, including white, there was a hearing of more overall and uh, overall inappropriate comments and uh, gen inappropriate gender comments, which non-white folks compared to non compared to white folks heard. I apologize. Lots of words to get through. So moving forward, learning from these overall base findings, what can be done now? Specifically learning from these findings specifically in terms of GS, uh, sorry, gender and race. I would encourage the Clark SES to encourage trainings, specifically inclusivity trainings, focused on proving sense of belonging for specifically gender and race. And that as informed by the survey and the specific section in which I asked what types of trainings people would like to see, I would encourage Clark SES leadership to encourage all of its members and community members to pursue trainings and efforts around cultural competency, creating inclusive workplace, preventing discrimination and harassment and other DEI trainings broadly. What can you do? So my findings are one thing and I'm completely I hear everyone say they're burnt out on surveys. And this is where I encourage each of you to do something individually, regardless of your status, race, gender, anything else, is that we all have people that we trust. And that's something that's been shared openly personally in addition to the survey. And I encourage each of you to please speak with those individuals whom you do trust. There are people here who listen, who will listen to you for who you are, whether that's within this department or else otherwise. And those resources are the first steps that we need to take in order to start making these instrumental changes more broadly. Another project I want to make sure I encourage I listed here is my involvement on Western's land back movement. Uh, back in the 33rd Headwires Conference in December of 2022, um, I helped host a portion of it. I invited eight other students from uh, eight different universities across the U.S. to come visit us for the focus of the conference, which was land back. I was then asked to organize the feedback around two main areas at the end of that conference. One being what type of verbiage would people like to see if Western were to adopt a land back statement? And then two, what types of actions would people like to see if Western were to pursue this? And so I organized all that information and quickly realized that it might end up in a folder somewhere. So I decided to pursue it a little bit more intentionally. And this has been my secondary project. Uh, Matt Aronson, who is here, has been my peer mentor and partner throughout this entire process. And we have created a and pursued building a movement around campus resulting in a 30-page document outlining suggested verbiage, um, an entire summary of past action, current action, and suggested action moving forward um, across WC's land camp across WCU's campus, not restricted to any singular department. And it has resulted in me speaking specifically with every club within the MCC, directly with SGA, and getting all of these organizations endorsements across student government across the DEI committee, faculty senate, cabinet, and then resulting in board of trustees, a meeting with them uh, tomorrow, which uh, President Brad Bach will be speaking with them, communicating that Western will be pursuing this and adopting it into the strategic plan in some fashion to intentionally build relationships with indigeneity and indigenous people moving forward, specifically Butte Mountain U. Again, I wanna establish that Mayor Anson has been a huge partner in my peer in all of this, and I thank you very much. And so this was a huge project that I also undertook. Again, moving to my thank yous, 
there's a lot of individuals I have listed here. There are many, many more, which I can say thank you to by name. Listed or non-listed here, I hear each of you and I appreciate for your willingness for sharing your histories and stories with me. I hear you and I hope that this is a first step to see those histories, whether it's been over the last five years or currently, uh, the action will be made moving forward to represent you and your tooth moving forward. Again, this is a start. Now I look to each of us to see it continued. Uh, this is a sense and this is what accountability looks like to pursue action for the love we have for this community and the shared place. Thank you and questions. It's not so much a question, but more a suggestion on your land back um, is considering the possibility of similar to a conservation easement, instead of actually transferring land to a cultural easement and experiment with that to allow tribal members to come on to have the land the landowner of record allow tribal members to come on there and collect you know, uh, important plants, hunting, other traditional practices. So I don't know if you've considered that, but thought I'd throw it out. <laughs> That's an awesome suggestion, and thank you. Uh, something that that is actually included and represented in the document. Something that I've also been trying to be as clear as I can throughout this process has been extremely internal, and I fully recognize that. Uh, my part is just in trying to better understand where Western's been at and hear all those stories. And a lot of the recommendations I've heard from these groups have been things just as that. Actually, inviting and making these grounds in this place and this community more available, and not whether it's financially, whether it's housing, but specifically the how we view the land, whether that in specific specifically the plants and things that we see upon it. And I remember that there was a uh, event in the past was by the MCC in which they were trying to encourage that exactly to happen. So I know that moving forward, there's gonna be some working with facilities to hopefully encourage doing just that. Matt. How are you going about the, um, or I guess I'm curious about her going about the coming to actions to, uh, I guess we, we want to, bring DEI competence more into the school. I imagine that having done this work, you have some ideas, and then uh, there's also maybe you want to just present to the administration and to Stephen Parker. And um, uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of how those actions might flourish and, and blossom? Of course, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, something I've tried to consider is not just letting this sit in a vault somewhere under some supervised hands to make sure it just is there and someone is aware. Uh, a key aspect is those trainings and more so the awareness that this school, uh, not necessarily is overseen by, but how it integrates and works internally. Um, the list of trainings that I offered is one way in which we can all begin to individually engage in these topics more robustly and then be on a commonplace understanding moving forward. Uh, this whole project is under the supervision directly of other peers, uh, such as Dr. M Dr. Micah Russell, Kate, Lance, the intern dean, in addition to specifically Stephen Parker and Provost Chesson. Stephen Parker is the vice president for inclusivity. And this is a project that's gonna be evaluated and looked back on with the intent of how they're addressing societal, at least communal change within the Clark School moving forward. And so I hope that someone answers your question. Well, don't change. So we're going to take a moment for the rest of the panel, I guess, to move out of the Gunnison Valley and kind of land into some different communities. So I moved to Denver to work with my community sponsor, Animal Assisted Therapy Programs of Colorado, not entirely sure what my project is going to be. But over the course of nine months of collaboration, this evolved into the creation of a holistic land management framework. My name is Sean Kohler, and I'm going to talk this presentation is going to be kind of walking you all through that process. So for a little bit of context, Animal Assisted Therapy Programs of Colorado, or AATPC, is a clinical mental health counseling center just outside of Denver based on a 3.5 acre range. Through a variety of modalities such as animal assisted therapy, play therapy, and conventional talk therapy, AATPC has been able to destigmatize therapy for a lot of their clients. 
this organization has been experiencing a rapid amount of growth recently. They're expecting to more than triple their number of clients in the next five to 10 years. And something that's so special about this place is this deep connection to the animals and the land that the Barking Cat Ranch provides. And there's been a little bit of growing concern that much, amidst such a rapid expansion, this connection might start to become compromised. And that's where my project comes in. When looking back at my project, I see it really breaking down into kind of two distinct phases. The first phase of the project was really outlined by me stepping into AATPC, getting to know the culture, learning the animals, and talking to all the staff figuring out what their hopes and desires were, were for the land moving forward. And this was an amazing process. I had so many enthusiastic conversations with people about things like solar panels, bat houses, compost systems, seed saving programs, flower gardens. These pictures right here show of a flower garden that I designed with some leftover construction bricks and built with the help of a volunteer group. And as amazing as all of these conversations were, by November, I got a little concerned. I saw my project growing in a lot of different directions with not a lot to combine it into one cohesive MEM project. Additionally, in November, my original community sponsor stepped away from the organization. Melissa Youngbauer, the property care manager, then stepped up to fill this role. And Melissa's main priority for my project was developing plans that would help restore the pasture lands. To do this, I took an extensive dive into resources around holistic land management provided by the Savory Institute. And this research really provided me two key insights that really pulled my project together. The first of these insights was the concept of holism. Now, holism essentially states that complex entities such as nature are made up of smaller individual whole pieces that when brought together make larger systems. Think of the animals and the trees that come together to create a forest. Utilizing this perspective, as well as the management tools associated with it, really allowed me to connect all of these diverse interests that had been expressed to me into one cohesive project. And I began creating a holistic land plan for the Barking Cat Ranch. Although it wasn't very long into this process that I began to realize the folly in this action. And that really comes from the second key insight. So one of the main pillars of holistic land management is the process of proactive observation. Noticing what's happening on the land today so that you can inform better decisions for tomorrow. The reason why this is so important is because the land is so inherently complex in and of itself that it's impossible to perfectly predict all of the outcomes of one action. Similar to driving across the country, you can't set a heading from your house and hope to drive in a straight line and reach your destination. While you're driving, you need to notice bends in the road and turn the steering wheel accordingly. It was here that I realized if I didn't teach anyone at AATPC how to do this, then this car wouldn't make it very far. So this really kind of takes me into the second phase of my project. The second phase of this was really defined by me working closely with Melissa to ensure that she understood the principles and practices of holistic land management. In weekly meetings from January through to the end of March, her and I would discuss these principles and practices, talk about what elements of them made sense, what elements seemed applicable to the ranch, what wasn't, and what elements needed to be adapted to the unique context that is the Barking Cat Ranch. Now this process was really an amazing process that really cemented my understanding of holistic land management. And through this, by the end of March, Melissa and I came up with a series of long-term development goals, as well as kind of some strategic actions to help us get there. <coughs> actions such as implementation of a rotational grazing plan is kind of indicated by this chart up here. Now, all of these actions and long-term goals culminated in what became the development of the holistic land management framework. This framework really consists of four main categories. There's management of the pasture lands, of the garden spaces, the compost systems, and volunteer engagement. The primary focus for the pasture management was developing and implementing a rotational grazing system, 
For the garden spaces, it was improving both of their therapeutic benefits as well as their growing practices. For the compost systems, it was designing and building a vegetable compost system. And for the volunteer engagement, it was ensuring that everything that's contained within this holistic land management framework can be effectively communicated to and performed by AATBC's amazing team of volunteers. They rely on a lot of these volunteers for a majority of their property care. So it would be fruitless to develop plans that could not be effectively communicated to this labor force. This framework really consists of a lot of action plans, guidelines, and educational resources. Now, these action plans and guidelines are really break down and define the what, how, and why of them to ensure that anyone within AATPC can really understand what these actions and guidelines are trying to accomplish. In total, this framework consists of 31 action plans. 59 guidelines and 180 educational resources, all contained within a Google folder for the organization. Here's an example of what just some of these materials look like. So for the pasture lands, we integrated a paradise pasture track system. Now what that is, you can see kind of drawn here, the track is outlining the pasture. That was integrated to ensure that the animal's quality of life and being able to get up and run around wasn't compromised as we divided small pastures into even smaller paddocks. The reason for that was that the land needed time to recover in between grazing, but the horses also needed space to get up and run. So this system was created as a compromise for that. This system also has some benefits in allowing a really easy system for volunteers to take the horses from these corrals and turn them out into the appropriate pastures based off of the grazing plan. An example on the guidelines, it has to do with a garden redesign guidelines that I outlined. The reason that these were outlined as a guideline is because there's currently a lot of unknowns around AATBC's garden space. One of these being the construction of a greenhouse that's probably going to go right there, but we're not entirely sure yet. The construction of this greenhouse has been delayed by several months, so it was more beneficial to the organization to have a flexible guideline as opposed to a rigid plan. This guideline outlines many practices that the that AATPC can do to redesign the garden space to make it more therapeutically benefit as well as guidelines for integrating some regenerative agriculture practices to grow more produce, because most of the produce that they grow in this garden is fed to the animals. For the compost system, I developed a three-bin vegetable compost system based off estimated volume of food waste that would be brought to the ranch. The design of this compost system was tailor fit to a space that AATBC had for it, as well as the complexity of its design was custom thought of kind of around the skill level of a volunteer group who is coming out to do a variety of construction projects on the ranch. Now, these are just three examples of everything that's contained within that framework. But these three examples, as well as everything else, is backed up by an extensive amount of educational resources. The reason behind this is that I saw it as paramount to ensure that anyone with AA, within AATPC understood these guidelines and frameworks because this understanding would allow them the flexibility to adapt and change these plans moving forward based on their changing need and changing capacity. These educational resources consist of Google Classrooms, summaries of information, as well as an extensive amount of first-hand resources that are accompanied by notes and Here's some of the animals. <laughs> Actually, all the animals. So uh, by combining all of these goals that were outlined for me by AATPC with an extensive amount of research, a little bit of creativity, as well as a lot of communication, Melissa and I were able to develop a holistic land management framework that's going to assist her in the future reaching all of AATPC's long-term land development goals. 
So the last couple of years of my time in the MEM program has been cast against the backdrop of a mental health journey. And while at times walking both of these paths has felt like it's added hardship to my life, I've come now to realize how integrated both of these paths were. The serendipity of working at a therapy ranch for my MEM project was not lost on me. My time at AATPC really helped to highlight how we cannot separate healing the environment from healing ourselves. The insights and progress that I made in both of these worlds was drawn from insights made between them. And it's important that as all of us move forward looking at healing the environment, we take a moment to look at ourselves as well, because we all deserve to live in the world that we are striving to create. I have so many people that I need to thank for this project, including Melissa. Without her enthusiastic support and open-mindedness, none of this would have happened. Also, her ability just to keep up with the onslaught of information that these meetings was was truly astonishing. I'd also like to thank Kate Clark, my faculty mentor. She was always there for me with crucial guidance and support at this really pivotal moment, moment in my life. I would also like to extend a thank you to MJ Pickett, although she wasn't an official faculty mentor, she basically was another mentor, as well as extend a thank you to all of the staff, animals, clients at AATPC. Without you, none of this could happen. Thank you to my friends and family, and as well, my partner, Autumn. Without your support, I don't know if I could be up here today. Rich? Uh, I assume that Melissa took over for Elizabeth Clark. Yes. Okay. Um, there is a potential to do a solar project. You mentioned solar on one of your slides. Yes. I don't know if there's stuff out in the field, but also just rooftop solar to offset their, um, their energy. Use. So if you want to get involved in that, mm -hmm. yeah, we have some <laughs> Fantastic. I know that that is something that Elizabeth started with this conversation with you and equitable solar solutions, but I wasn't quite sure where it has been at once Elizabeth left, but I know that as an organization, they are still very interested in getting solar installed mostly on their roof. Yeah, if you can help us engage. Yeah, I'll help make sure that net networking still happens. Yes? What's your favorite part of the project? Oh, I think the, my favorite part of the project was really seeing kind of this alternative system to agriculture that I hadn't thought of before. The last couple of years that I've been really getting integrated into agriculture, I've seen two kind of conflicting ethoses clashing in my brain, one being a vegetarian. I, want to pet the animals and not eat them, but then also realizing that you can't really have regenerative agriculture without animals, and it's hard to have animals on a farm that don't produce income, but it was incredible to kind of get my eyes open to alternatives to having animals provide a revenue stream for a farm or an organization like this without taking kind of the traditional eat them route. So that was really cool. That really opened my mind to kind of different approaches to regenerative agriculture. Um, so I'm gonna pass the stage over to Davis, who is joining us on Zoom. Okay, hello everyone, can you hear me? Uh, some sort of confirmation before I start? Yeah, yeah, yeah we got you, Davis. <laughs> Great, awesome. Well, thank you so much for everyone for coming to my presentation. Uh, I'll be presenting on increasing climate and community resilience through cooperative farming in the Garwal Himalayas. So, Okay, so where am I? Why am I not with all of you beautiful people in Gunnison, Colorado, presenting at the MEM Community Forum? Well, I'm in India. I've been here since August last year. More specifically, I'm in the state of Uttarakhand, which is in the north of India, bordering Tibet, uh, Tibet and China. And I am in the Garhwal region. There are two regions of Uttarakhand, uh, the Garhwal and Kumaon. And I've 
My project focused primarily in the Tiri Garwal and the Pari Garwal districts of the Garwal region. Uh, but why? Why am I here? Uh, some of you may remember my project proposal last fall about the development of a pharma co-op in Uttarakhand, India. Well, that didn't quite work out. Um, so as many of our projects evolved, I had to pivot. Uh, once I learned that these cooperatives are very alive and flourishing really in a lot of these communities, specifically in the community that I planned on developing this uh, cooperative. So I shifted a little bit to learn about how these farmer property systems can improve the livelihoods, climate resilience, and overall well-being of farmers, communities, and the environment in the Garwal Himalayas. But I didn't want to just research and learn more about these. I wanted to provide something and uh, so I wrote a, a set of recommendations that can be used by the NGOs and the farmers and the groups um, in these communities to hopefully improve their livelihoods throughout the time. Uh, so what did I do? Well, I spent my first three months learning Hindi. I got an award for my grant to do 240 hours of Hindi language training at the Landor Language School. <laughs> so I could actually talk to these farmers and interact with these communities at a deeper level. And I went to the Navdanya Biodiversity Forum farm in Dehradun uh, and for a course on biodiversity and agroecology farming. So I got to learn directly from their agricultural trainers and experts. Uh, and I got to learn or see their seed bank and learn about their seeds of warranty, seed saving and seed um, security practices and programs. And I got to meet and learn directly from Dr. Vandana Shiva, which was really inspiring and uh, incredible. She taught most of our classes while I was there. And more importantly, even I got to meet the growing community of uh, global citizens who come from all over the world to come to places like Navdanya to learn about how agriculture can be used to improve the sustainability of our uh, communities, our ecosystems, our environment, and address the climate crisis that our world is facing. So I felt really inspired by these international, uh, this international community to go out into the world and be this agent of change uh, with agriculture as our tool. Uh, so I went out and I talked to farmers to learn about their challenges, to learn about their practices. I talked to women cooperative groups called self-help groups to learn also about their challenges and practices. But I didn't want to just learn about their challenges and practices. I was also interested in the assistance they're receiving from their supportive NGOs and government agencies. And so I learned and talked to uh, different community leaders, people who have been with these uh, farmer cooperative groups for years or even decades and uh, helped themselves improve their livelihoods, help their households and community members all improve their livelihoods using these cooperative uh, farming groups. And I talked to the agricultural trainers at different uh, agencies, government agencies, such as the State Department of Horticulture, to learn about their subsidy programs and programs of assistance for farmers and uh, different cooperative groups that improve their livelihoods. And really a key piece was talking to the NGOs that do the work with these cooperative groups and use the, the models, uh, the cooperative model as a vehicle for improving the livelihoods of these communities. And so I talked to five different NGOs across the Garwal region. Um, these are the NGOs I talked to. And of course, I wanted to learn about the breadth and depth of their work, how many NGOs or how many FPOs and SHGs and households they work with. But more importantly, I wanted to learn about the different programs of assistance that they have. So a lot of them use, like I said, these cooperative groups as a vehicle for their different programs. And a lot of them use agriculture, focus on agriculture, but a lot of them do so much more like work on education and health, water and sanitation, community development, and different programs for livelihood and um, organization improvement. And so what did I learn? Uh, well, I learned a lot about the farming practices, the agricultural practices in Uttarakhand and Garwal in the Himalaya, uh, which is largely rain fed and relies on these uh, large terrace systems. And of course about the abandoned land that's being left behind by all the people that are leaving their traditional farming villages to go to the city, which is creating more issues for the communities. And I learned about the uh, Apple Mission pro uh, Program, which is um, the main program for the Department of Horticulture. Uh, it's a high density apple orchards. They're planted about a meter apart that uh, it increases their production and they provide subsidy for the saplings, the irrigation, the trellis, the fencing, even the training for the farmers to produce apples in the region. 
And I learned about the cooperative farming uh, program or share labor practices of the women cooperative groups. So this is a picture of women that are planting potatoes in one woman's field during the planting time. Labor is um, at high demand so that they, they share their labor. Um, and then one other thing, of course, is I learned about the challenges of these communities, uh, climate change being a big one. So this is a picture of Canatal, the main community that I worked with in February this year. Last year, around this time, there was about four feet of snow. And this year, there was less than a foot even, and this picture was totally dry. And so as the temperatures warm and the uh, precipitation changes from less snow to more rain and the monsoon patterns change, it's creating a huge uh, water scarcity problem. And because these communities are so dependent on water, rain-fed agriculture, it creates a huge uh, livelihood security issue as well. Another big issue for the area, as I mentioned, is the out migration of rural youth. So as the rural youth are seeking better employment and livelihoods, they're moving to the larger cities such as Dehradun, New Delhi, and Mumbai. And this is leaving behind thousands of ghost villages across the Uttarakhand and uh, Himalaya region. And this is, it's often the young men that are leaving behind the villages. So it's the women, the children, and the elderly that are left in these villages. And this puts further stress on the women because they're the ones that are left to do the housework and care for the children and elderly and do the farming. And so this is leading to a greater need for the education and empowerment of the women of these communities because they take the disproportionate burden of effects due to climate change and migration. And they're not given the same opportunities and encouragement for pursuing education. This is leading to what's being called the feminization of agriculture. Um, so because it's the men who are <laughs> leaving, it's leaving behind the women who are the ones to do all of the farming when traditionally it was a shared practice. This top picture is a picture of uh, women in a cooperative group that are getting training on the SHG management in, from, from the NGO and that they're associated with. The bottom picture is a picture of an education program for women and they're learning computer skills and computer competency to improve their employable skills for, for themselves for the future. So some of the cooperative farming models that I looked at, the first one is the SHG or self-help group model. This is a group of 10 to 20 women that live in the same village and share similar social and economic predicaments. And they contribute a monthly fee, usually 100 or 200 rupees, which is about uh, between one and $3 uh, to the shared savings account so that they can take out a loan at super low interest rather than having to rely on external uh, financial institutions such as banks that cost that uh, charge larger interest rates, such as five or 6%. The other one is the farmer producer organization or FPOs. This is a group of large, a larger group of farmers usually can contain hundreds of SHGs or even thousands of members. And this provides access to facilities such as post-production facilities for making pickles and jams and juices. And then also can help create uh, a brand for their, late, for their pro products and marketing uh, for their products as well. So my primary findings, <clears throat> uh, the two biggest ones were that water shortages and wildlife pressure are the primary challenges and concerns for the farmers in this area. One way to combat this is through the rainwater catchments uh, such as this that can help increase uh, the resilience to, to drought and changing monsoons. This is a 22,000 liter rainwater catchment basin uh, built in part by the NGO that the SHG is associated with. Uh, the other way is uh, through poly houses. Uh, you guys call them hoop houses or long houses sometimes in the States. Um, these are an effective way to pr protect against wildlife such as monkeys and wild boar. So there's a picture of two poly houses in an SHG garden that was built by the National Rural Livelihood Mission, which is a government program across India that supports SHGs. Now, I can also uh, extend the season as many of you know in Gunnison, they're a vital way to grow vegetables through the winter. And then uh, that these NGOs and government agencies really are working hard to provide assistance to these farmers through these subsidy programs. Uh, another thing is that these off-farm job opportunities are really key to improving the rural economies because of these traditional uh, communities are largely reliant on agriculture or sometimes over-dependent on agriculture for their primary income. Uh, this is a huge reason many people are leaving these communities. So having other opportunities for jobs and employment that can keep people in their communities rather than leaving is a huge uh, key. And then that these women's cooperative groups really can help increase the financial autonomy and stability and resilience of these households. So what did I get done? Well, I bit, wrote a big fancy report for my academic advisor here at the university. 
And in that report, I wrote a list of recommendations that are in addition to the existing programs of assistance to these uh, cooperative groups. Um, one of them is focused on this wildlife pressure on agricultural land through live fencing and agroforestry practices and monkey deterrent techniques. So planting uh, thorny species such as shrubs and trees around the terraced agriculture, uh, terraced uh, land or farmland. The other way is uh, addressing lack of water resources through um, water conservation techniques such as mulching and drip irrigation, cover cropping, and then also restoring the traditional water, water harvesting practices. So a lot of the traditional water harvesting practices have been left behind in favor of the subsidized newer models that are built with government money with concrete and brick. However, these aren't entirely sustainable because they require outside funding and materials and are harder to repair and build. Uh, options for connecting the agricultural economy with rising ecotourism demands. So as there uh, are many more demands for ecotourism, building things like farm homestays and farm to table restaurants and connecting the organic agriculture supply from the hill regions to the organic um, food demand in the cities is really vital to uh, making sure that these communities can continue. And then options for organic and biodiverse agriculture. Um, so although these communities are traditionally uh, organic, providing uh, options for intercropping, like in their new apple orchards, homemade organic inputs, and uh, composting that is protecting from wildlife. And I'm getting low on time, so just a few pictures to represent these recommendations are here. And then lastly, how does this relate my project here to what's going on there and across the mountain community? So we know how mountains are water towers of the world. And we can take that one step further and look at how mountain communities are water towers of the world because they really play a vital role in managing these resources. And so where I live in Srinagar, Uttarakhand is in the heart of the Garwal Himalaya, just as you guys are in the heart of the Rockies. And so we can see how increasing the community and climate resilience of these communities really plays a key role in the management and sustainability of our global resources. And we can do that through preserving trad traditional knowledge and cultures and promoting ecological biodiverse agriculture systems and sustainable community development through community collaboration and cooperative frameworks. That's kind of what all of our projects we're really looking at is community guidance. Just a quick second for all of my many acknowledgements. I have so much thanks to give to so many people and organizations. Uh, namely, this project wouldn't have been able to happen without the Fulbright Nehru Student Research Grant that I received. So thank you for everyone who assisted in that. Uh, and thank you to the United States India Educational Foundation for administering that grant. Thank you to my Western Colorado University faculty advisor, MJ Pickett, for providing support all the way across the world. And thank you to the Himbati Nanan Bahugana Garwal University faculty and staff for supporting my project, and Dr. Negi at the Department of Rural Technology for being my academic advisor. And thank you to the guest house staff for accommodating me during my stay, my family who was able to come visit. That was really great. And last but not least, thank you to my partner for coming and living with me for five months while I was here in India. And with that, I'll say Danyavad, thank you, and I'll take 30 seconds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey Davis, what, what was it like to meet and get to learn from Vandana Shiva? As it sounds like it was a really cool experience. 30 seconds ago. Yeah, thanks for the question. It was really incredible. Uh, she's so wonderful. Um, she taught most of our classes. Uh, we went to the field and learned from their technical uh, trainers at the biodiversity farm and then had classroom time with her. And um, she just is very eloquent in her speech and she's so inspiring. And she inspired me personally in, in many ways. And I feel very uh, grateful and thankful to have the opportunity. So uh, one last acknowledgement would be to the uh, Margie and John Haley Environmental Fund for providing funding for me to be able to go and do that because I was really lifelong great experience that I got. Thank you. Timekeeping is that now we have 10 minutes for questions from panelists. I have a question for the panel uh, and that is you all worked with a bunch of different communities, um, a bunch of different types of people. I'm kind of curious as to if any of you encountered any pushback, whether it was to you personally or to the community or to uh, like the things you were trying to implement. I can start. 
I I experienced a little bit of pushback initially stepping into the ranch, and this pushback came from a really earnest place. It's kind of a difficult role stepping into a community and analyzing kind of what's going on and noticing shortcomings. Although this was handled really well by my community sponsor. And the biggest way that I kind of think we navigated this so well was really by quickly aligning, like figuring out that we were both going towards the same goal. We both had the same objectives, the same desires that we wanted to see. And so all we were trying to do was improve that together. That was really well said. This is a short amount of time to try to figure out an idea. Uh, mine, because it was focused here and I've been here for the time that I have, I feel very, very lucky and privileged in the context that I've been here for five years and know pretty well uh, both and for both these projects, but focusing on the belonging inclusivity assessment, the Clark SES as a whole. I have an understanding of it. I have a relationship with the people who are here. And so removing that while I'm conducting this research was evident. In terms of pushback, I think that is entirely appropriate to say, yeah, and being here in a place that we call home and we want to believe is inherently safe just because that's where we go and that's where we spend most, of our, spend most of our time. I think that the feedback I, or the pushback I got wasn't explicit in telling me that the work I was doing was invalid or didn't belong or didn't have a place here. Instead, it was like just being honest with those things that like I get so I as an individual and like my community, it's so used to guarding. And so I think that was more so the pushback was just that building a basis and a platform to be transparent and honest. Yeah, I would kind of echo some of that. And uh, I would say that I didn't really receive a lot of resistance about what the work that I was going to do. But there is um, just a kind of a, a dour take on the world from some of these places. And sometimes people uh, can tend to feel like things are a little bit hopeless and the pushback can just be on almost any effort that tries to answer it as a solution. Um, and we kind of learned about this in uh, the intensive last uh, summer where we said, we know we're not really trying to make solutions. We're just trying to take actions that really make a difference. And I feel like that's where we've sort of uh, overcome any of the resistance that may have encountered. But yeah, I absolutely find some people that I, you know, uh, encountered with this work who were just like, well, I'm really glad you're doing that. Don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know either, but you know, we, we do have to do something. And uh, this is beginning a process that has a lot of meaning deeply and internally <laughs> for a lot of people. So I feel like that's where we kind of overcome that barrier. Great. Yeah, I think this is a, a very classic question for my context of being uh, in a foreign community, uh, being a white male coming to a traditionally agricultural community and saying, this is what you should do, or this is my recommendations for how to do your life better that you've been doing for generations. Uh, so I think largely, I try to be aware of my positionality and only produce recommendations from my experience and my understanding and things that not only I've learned from experts such as the Navdanya community, but other NGOs that they are practicing, or even learning about traditional practices that have not been practiced anymore. I didn't mention about the traditional grains that Navdanya really promotes and other NGOs are trying to bring traditional grains back to these communities because they've been left behind in favor of um, you know, modern, you know, tastes or a sense of green revolution, different preferences. Uh, so as far as pushback, most of the farmers that I talked to and worked with were really interested and excited to have me around. And, you know, they don't get to interact with an American very much. So it's exciting, but they also are very curious about my ideas. You know, I would every day go over and talk to one of these farmers I would get a new idea or I would see some berry, you know, in on the internet or in the in the woods and be like, what about this? Like, can you guys grow this? Like, oh yeah, like they used to like far, you know, pick that wild like all the time. And now there isn't many of them left. And I was like, well, what if we like try to bring these traditional foods back? And they were all very engaged. So um I tried to be aware of my position as an outsider and know that they have lots of knowledge that I don't, but I felt like it was really a good way to collaborate with it as an outsider, you know, coming in with kind of a fresh idea. Um, so I guess that would be my answer. Go ahead, Brett. 
Um, so I, I have a couple specific questions, but I, I figured out a way to kind of broaden it out to the group. So I'm going to start with this specific one. So um, we're landed. Um, we know that like local longtime residents are not like a monolithic group. And so as you worked on your project, did you encounter difference or division when working with locals? And how did that, how did then the kind of influx of, of new folks um, impact those existing dynamics? Um, and for Chase, um, it seems that a particular challenge of trying to enact change in a, in a university environment is the transitory nature of a university, um, especially with students, but also with faculty and staff. Um, and so uh, how did you kind of like think about that in, within your project? And so then kind of broadening out to, to everyone, um, y'all are kind of addressing transitions and like we're in a time of global transition, right? And so how did how did that impact your work, how, how you thought about it, and how you think about this work going forward? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so to answer your, your question to me, I think I definitely encountered that that fact that you brought up that you know it's not a long group. There's a lot of diversity represented by people who are even in this local category. And um, I tried to hold space for that in the projects. Um, I think that's an important piece of inclusivity is not excluding anyone simply because their perspective doesn't align with maybe the majority of what we feel should be in there. Uh, so I held space in that um, I've allowed pretty much anyone to express what they want as long as they can do so civilly and respectfully. And um, there absolutely is going to be conflict within this sort of online resource that I'm creating. There will be perspectives that maybe have tension between each other and don't uh, completely agree or hold the same line on some issues. I'm welcoming that and actually as an editor for the projects trying to draw people's attention to that, that tension um, so that they can inform themselves about how the different sides approach where they're coming from and uh, really what informs those differing opinions. Um, so I feel like the, the, the discourse that actually happens because of conflicts can be more rewarding than simply having agreement with other people. Um, and in a complex sort of a, a community, I feel like all of us will encounter that and we should welcome it, we should lean into it and probably um, try to just understand where it comes from because it, it can actually be a teachable moment a lot more so than uh, simply having an across the board agreement. Just to make sure I understand your question correctly, you're talking yeah. about a turnover, uh, particularly for students in terms of them being transitionary. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, and how to kind of create lasting change. And, and like one of the statistics that you showed that I, I thought was like really telling was like kind of within the different groups as far as like students, faculty, staff, it seemed like there's a higher level of like believing that there was some DIY competency, but at, at the broad level is showing like institutionally, like maybe there's issues. And so like, in my mind, uh, that's a whole conversation, but like how, so how, how do you implement like lasting change at an institutional level? I, this is a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I, I didn't, like, 30 second answer. All right. Uh, I'll start with a story. Four years ago, I was told that students are typically transient and don't have the ability to institute or implement long standing state change for university. That has been a sole motivator for me since. And in summary, from what I found, it comes down from the individual effort of every person within that community. So whether you're a student, a factory, or staff, there's a perceived level of belonging in between each of those groups. Even though it doesn't show in this context, each of these groups has a role that they play. And it's an inherently exclusionary. It's a colonized mentality that we exist within. The more that we decolonize and see each other as siblings, as friends, as mentors, and other humans, if nothing else, the more we can return to an aspect and embrace a mentality which encourages a likeness and understanding, which they can get, which can then become systemic. I hope that answers for 30 seconds. <laughs> Read and it will be the stretch and Thomas 